welcome to this session. Um, technology for me, okay, is something which really excites me. I'm often the geekiest person in the room. Who can tell me, and if I've told you before, um, please don't go, I know, because I've told you told me. Um, but who can tell me what is this thing on my wrist right here? Bearing in mind, I'm currently wearing an Apple Watch, so it's not a Fitbit or anything like that. What is this thing on my wrist here? Any guesses? Fashion. Fashion. It's, it is fashionable. Chris, I'll give you that. It's very fashionable. We'll see just how fashionable you can be in just a few moments. Um, this, ladies and gentlemen, go on. Pokemon Go, indeed. This device here will both spin and is spinning Pokestops and catching Pokemon in Pokemon Go right now. So I think that gives me my credentials as being pretty geeky. But technology for me works best when it's seamless, it's simple. So little things like this, you might be wanting to sort of read through all this here, but I can with the press of a button go, uh, 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 eyes back on me please class. So simple technology for me can work really, really, really well. And a big barrier and obstacle with implementation in schools is when staff don't have that confidence and sometimes competence to make that technology work. In this session, you'll see some really amazing things that you can do with technology. You'll see some things that might inspire you to go back and share with your colleagues when you go back next week. One of the great things with AI is that it is super easy to use and it's really good at helping reduce workload and helping people to uh, make a difference in quick and simple and easy ways. But I'm going to be asking you some questions, uh, some challenges really, about how you're thinking about using technology, not just with AI, but other technologies in your school. Because again, it's all very well and good having someone like Chris in your school, who is you know, your, your ed tech legend, your you know, person who's doing really, really well, being impactful, all the rest of it. But in my experience, when it comes to working and getting people using technology confidently and competently at scale, your implementations are only ever really as good as your lowest common denominator. What you want is a similar experience for every kid in every class when they're moving around, particularly in secondary. And if you're in primary, you know, an experience they get in year three, you want to continue that same level, but up a little bit into year four, year five, year six. How do you get that consistency at scale? And keeping it simple, silly, is you know, that acronym KISS, is something that I share an awful lot about uh, around as well. But the thing is, for many teachers, technology is really, really like, oh my goodness, it's really kind of scary. Because when you use technology with young people, we often get this wow moment. You know, I was talking with um, a, a reasonably local uh, digital lead uh, recently uh, about using AR in the classroom and does amazing work with augmented reality and mixed reality. And children do this sort of thing. When my children were younger, you know, my own children would say to me around AR products, you know, Daddy, can we do the magic? They saw it as being actual magic. But the thing is with teachers, this is the reaction you tend to get more than the awe and wonder. And then when the Wi-Fi goes down and everything goes flying out the window and we're like, oh my goodness, what do we do? How can we make it work? Ah, it's so scary. So what can we do to help teachers feel more happy, confident, uh, and, and able to use the technology rather than leaving it dusty in a cupboard at the back of the classroom, gathering dust, not being implemented, not being used, so forth and so on. Technology is amazing. Who would like one of these? As soon as my son saw it on the launch from Apple recently, you know, he was like, da, 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 da. It was like that, you know? And he is a proper mini me, is my Dougie. But again, technology, just because you can do something with technology, doesn't necessarily mean that you should. Okay, so it's an amazing device. He's been coming at me with all of the Apple sort of blurb. You know, Dad, if you did buy me an iPad and an iPhone, and a HomePod, and some AirPods, and an Apple TV, and a MacBook. Well, if you bought all those things and put that price together, that's more expensive than that, Dad. <laughs> if you do the maths, it's only about 40 pounds. But it is an amazing piece of kit, and I'm really excited about the things that you can do with it. You know, this is a quote from one of my favorite films. Um, anyone recognize the quote or the image there? Uh, Ready Player One, exactly. You know, it's an amazing opportunity. And sure, you know, if I was to you know, buy one of these things, you know, it would be cheaper than buying all those different bits of kit. But 
Is that right for the classroom? I've done some great work with Cardiff and Vale College uh, in, in Cardiff, as you might imagine. And they're using VR there to do some amazing things with modeling. They're doing things, this is quotes uh, about um, some, the summer model from Ruben Puentejura, and uh, talks about sort of digital transformation where he says, technology affords us the opportunity to do things that wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the technology. And that sort of thing can be really transformational. But again, just because you can do some things with the technology doesn't mean that you should. I love technology, as you're probably getting from what I'm sharing with you. But I'm equally as happy about people not choosing to use technology. And that's where cognizance comes in, where you make informed decisions about whether technology can help or hinder, whether it can improve and enhance or actually detract from what it is you're trying to do in the classroom. I'll do a quick shout out for Tilly at the back there. She works at a company called Now Press Play. Uh, immersive headphones, pop your headphones on please Tilly, I can see them on your head. Immersive audio experiences for children. You might think, well, you know, that's, that's, that's rubbish. But what you find from the research, when children use this product, they do go on these virtual journeys, but they're doing it all together. They're all going to be transported to this place and, and experiencing this and then doing great follow-up work with the resources that are in there, okay? But if we're using a device like this, okay, where, you don't act, this happens based upon what you're immersed in when you're using the device. You don't actually get to see people's eyes. What it does is, is if you're looking at somewhere people can still see you, it puts a virtual version of your eyes in there. It, it's got so many sensors inside. When you're on FaceTime, it creates a virtual avatar of yourself. So when people are talking to you, they don't actually see you. They see a virtual version of yourself. For me, that's kind of scary. And then look at the sort of world in which we're living. You know, if we've got all this in front of us, I mean, I worry about, you know, that there's this um, phantom pocket vibration syndrome. You know, that thing where you think your pocket's vibrating because, and people become addicted to notifications. That endorphin hit that you get when you get a notification. And it, it's, I love technology, but just because you can do something doesn't necessarily mean that you should. So what does the future hold? with technology. Well, there are so many new things coming out. We're talking about AI in this session. Um, but there's XR. XR is the sort of cumulative term for AR, MR, VR, all those sorts of things. We've got robotics, blockchain, so many different things to think about in the future, about the potential of what we can do with technology. But leading on technology is not the same as using technology in the classroom. And how do we as school leaders stay on top of the future of computing? Does anyone know what a BCI is? Anyone know what a BCI is? It's a brain-computer interface. Did you know that, Abby? Brain-computer interface, where you have a chip in your brain. This is, these, these are true things. That be, this isn't science fiction. This is science fact. Companies are working now on chips that you can control using neuron firing from your brain. You know, when I, when I was a child and I watched Star Trek, I see, I told you I was a geek. I was watching Next Generation, Geordie LaForge walking around with his pad in his hand. Never in my lifetime will I see this technology. And look at us all now. You know, look how slim our phones are, how big the screens are. It's bonkers. Moore's Law, which is the theory which states that technology advances at the speed of a processor doubles every two years, really does make amazing things happen with technology. And the things we can do with artificial intelligence are amazing. These are things we can do right now. We can use tools like Microsoft Designer. Um, this incorporates um, OpenAI. OpenAI is the company um, that developed ChatGPT. This is for making graphics. The key word for this sort of thing, if you wanted to create this sort of effect, is quilling. Okay, who'd have thought in you know, 2023 we're talking about quilling? But if you want this sort of effect using DALI 2, similar things work in Adobe's product Firefly, which I'll share a little bit about uh, right now. But if you want more on Firefly and amazing things you can do with Firefly, please do attend a Georgina Dean's Adobe session later where she's doing a deep dive into that with lots of ideas for teaching and learning. What about QR codes that you can make with art, uh, make as up pieces of art? This, these were ones that I shared quite recently. And... Um, Late o'clock, I won't say the exact time, but recently, uh, a certain gentleman sat at the back of the room who attended the event I was speaking at, uh, Mr. Abid Patel, give us a wave, Abid. Uh, he sent me a message, Mark, how did you make these? Well, actually, no, I didn't actually make them. Technology in this space with AI is happening so quick. You can now, thanks to Abid telling me about this, you can now make these easily yourself. If you go to huggingface.co, 
It's a long address. I'll tweet the link afterwards. There's a blog post um, on my website about how we do this. But you simply type a prompt, like you do with ChatGPT or Bard or whatever, okay? Say what you want the image to be, and it'll make a QR code for you. If you scan that QR code now, try it, it'll take you to my website. Absolutely bonkers that we have these sorts of technologies available to us. And it takes moments. But that's great. But what's I got to do with learning? Well, there are so many other things we can do. I'll dive more into the learning stuff uh, in just a moment. But talking about art, here you go, Chris. This is your time to shine, Chris. <coughs> can you spot the difference? There's Chris. There's Chris again. That was Chris last night. <coughs> and there's Chris practicing out there on his golf swing now. Look. Now, obviously, all I've done is use some simple technology, okay? This isn't done using um, Adobe Firefly. I simply scrub over Chris's body, <coughs> like I did last night, Chris, and I tell with a prompt what I want to be replaced with Chris, and he does it for you, okay? Now, you can see I wasn't very good with the sort of brush around the edge of his face just here. It looks like this when we do it, okay? In fact, if I jump across into Chrome a second, if it won't let me do this, I should, hopefully, yeah, better show you. If I just hit cancel, that's what I did. I just scrubbed out all the stuff around him. I typed the prompt, uh, playing golf on the beach down the bottom there, and it did it for me. It's that quick and easy. It takes seconds. Firefly.adobe.com uh, to do uh, that sort of thing. That opening slide, which had the lovely graphic in it, you can also create these sorts of things. There are other tools available, mid-journey, so forth and so on. But again, Adobe Firefly, firefly.adobe.com. You type in the prompt you want, student in a futuristic city, bokeh, neon lights, boom, boom, boom. Now, I'm not going to steal Georgina's thunder, because I'm sure she's going to be telling you loads of ways in which you can use this. Because Just because you can do this doesn't mean to say you should. But what if you're looking for a prompt to sort of inspire creative writing? What if you want a book cover because the children does some amazing work? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? We can use these things to really support our work in the classroom. A fantastic colleague of mine who wrote a brilliant book called Full On Learning, Zoe Elder, she worked with me on an iPad one-to-one -one I did back in 2011. And our mantra, which was something she said, which is why I'll share it with you, um, technology should enhance not dictate the learning. And it's such a powerful thing to remember because just because you can do something with technology doesn't necessarily mean that you should. And how do you differentiate between what is real and what's not? It's a fantastic free um, tool from Google at the moment. If you go onto Google and type odd one out AI, okay, it'll run a little quiz for you. You get that sort of 10 seconds or so and you've got to pick which of the items here were generated by artificial intelligence. So three of those are real photos, one of them isn't. And it's amazing when you consider and think about, well, what is, what is that one there? Because, and I'll, I'll go into this in more detail um, uh, later on in the presentation, but when it comes to the uh, amazing things we can do with all of these tools, what are our teachers using? What are our children using? How are they using it? What data is being shared? What algorithmic bias is going on in the background? Where's the consistency? Where's the training? Where's the support? There are so many things, bless you. There are so many things for you to, it's warm up here. There are so many things for you to have to consider when you're wanting to implement these sorts of things at scale. And it's not just art and um, sort of saving time with prompts and all the rest of it. This is another tool from Google with their AI test kitchen. You simply type a prompt, okay, and it then makes the music for you. I don't think I've got audio working on this. I'll see if it's going to work for me. Um, should open up here. My sound is, it'll just play through my Mac, but you'll, you'll better hear that there's music playing. It'll take a second. Hopefully, you'll take my word for it that you type in the prompt and a few seconds later, it will make some music for you. Now, how many people worry about music for the background of podcasts, for um, use on videos that you're making with children, all these sorts of things? 
You, know, you put it onto platforms like YouTube, it gets taken down because of copyrights of music. Use something like this, you can download the music, use it as your background. It's not perfect, it's not like it's Elton John, like you saw um, Nick sharing earlier on the stage, but it's good enough. So many great tools out there that we can use to help and support teaching and learning in the classroom. But as I keep on repeating, and hopefully I'm driving the message home, just because you can do something with technology doesn't necessarily mean that you should. Let's take a little step back a second, okay? Right? And I'm, 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 Chris McFall from Apple used this example uh, back a few weeks ago, and I'm going to try, try the exact same thing. See, it, it, it was a brilliant thing to do. Get a read on the room. Who in the room, and it's kind of linked to this a little bit, who in the room knows the word or the phrase ghetto blaster? Right? Oh, thank goodness. Okay, so you'll all know the answer to this question. I don't need to say anything more than the ghetto blaster thing, right? Okay? Um, we all remember things like this, right? My, <laughs> every morning, doing my register for Sims, I'd send it down to the room so they could get read by the OMR reader. You know, when I was a kid, everyone... You know, a, a room as big as this, year 500, you know, year five, year six, is sat with their legs crossed, watching, you know, something on the, on the telly, worrying it'll get knocked over. Technology will come and technology will go. But something that I always share, do you get the idea? Right, because clearly I'm a bit of an Apple fanboy, right? But... I don't really mind what devices, what tools schools choose to use. Whether you're a Google school, whether you're a Microsoft school, whether you're a, an Apple school. And I've worked in and work with now with my consultancy work and support and training and things. I work with them all. But it's about, often, with these sorts of things, nothing to do with technology. It's all to do with people. Because if you can't get those people who are worried or scared or you know, thinking this isn't for me or aren't feeling confident, all those sorts of things, then it doesn't matter what technology you've got, how much money you've spent on it, so forth and so on, it's not going to make a blind bit of difference. And then coupling it with you know, keeping that whole sort of pedagogy first thing for the classroom, making it so that you keep whatever you're trying to do laser focused on how it can have an impact on teaching and learning. My North Star for decades now, really, has, has been the TPAC model, technological, it's a bit of a mouthful, technological, pedagogical, content knowledge uh, framework from Kola and Mishra. But one of my favorite things about that model, where you have the Venn diagram with the technological knowledge, content knowledge, and pedagogical, pedagogical knowledge, which is a development from um, Shulman's PCK model, the thing that Kohler and Misha themselves say in the middle, and I'm not very good at quoting things verbatim, but <clears throat> you'd think with those three domains, in the middle, it would be about using technology all the time, but it's not. It's about being able to make informed choices about technology, because sometimes, and this is the best choice, I think that's the bit I'm going to say, um, it's not about using, it's about making these informed choices, about whether it's right to or not to. And that, for me, is an amazing sweet spot. As someone who's spent a fair amount of time in this session saying how much I love tech, but just because you can do it, I won't repeat it because I've said that, I think I've said that message yet enough. But keeping things simple, you know, making it so that what you're doing is accessible but laser-focused on how it can support and enhance teaching and learning. Something else my former colleague Zoe spent a lot of time talking about was marginal gains. We've all heard well, most of us will have heard about marginal gains, developed from the um, ideas of David Brailsford around Team GB with their cycling and things. But there's no silver bullet in education, whether it's technology, whether it's AI, whether it's anything else. This is a great newish product uh, called Merlin Mind. And it's a bit like, and I won't say the S word, um, Siri, um, but it's a bit like Alexa for your classroom. Right, so you have this linked into your Wi-Fi and your board and all the rest of it, and you tell it to do stuff, I open my slide, go next slide. It's a bit like a clicker on speed using your voice, okay? It is so, 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 so much more. Um, and this is absolutely, you know, blowing people's socks off. But it's not in and of itself going to transform things. 
It's those little wins, those few moments, those microseconds of time you save. One of the most unsexy things I share that can have the biggest impact on productivity is keyboard shortcuts, right? Keyboard shortcuts are like, they are not sexy, right? Although, to be fair, if you use Command, Control, Shift, and 5 on a Mac, which is, I feel like Liberace when I'm doing it, right? It's Windows Shift S for Windows users, right? It's what you do for snipping. But things like that, if you can save yourself a few microseconds every time you do these things, when you aggregate them, end of the day, week, month, year, how much time have you saved? And that's where things like AI can be massively, massively helpful, really, really useful, reducing workload, helping students learn, helping teachers teach. There's so much we can do. So for example, being really precise with your prompts is really, really useful. You know, don't just say create a mind map on hypertension. Tell it what is the topic, be specific. It probably won't work first time. This one will work first time. You know, you bang it in here, I've been really, really specific. And it would create a fantastic mind map. It would do it as a table. I spent an awful lot of time making it so that when I use this prompt and I go into something like ChatGPT over here, this is where I'm hoping my Wi-Fi connection will hold up, it will create a fantastic, come on Wi-Fi, a fantastic table for me that breaks things down really quick, easy, so forth and so on, and really help me with what it is that I'm trying to do. And don't forget other tools are available. I'm just going to nick another one from over here a second. And I'm going to use Bard at this time. This is Google's uh, generative AI product. And this one asks it to create a table that compares ChatGPT, GPT Plus, and Bard. Now, I can't ask this question on ChatGPT because ChatGPT's data set runs out in um, at end of 2021. I can't search the internet. It's not gonna bring these things in, okay? And it'll put the price on bar there. It's free for education if you want to. But there are wins over both, but how can a teacher make a discerning um, uh, decision about which to use, ChatGPT or Bard? Well, it comes from that support. It comes from having the confidence and competence and then cognizance about which is best to choose. I'm working with um, a friend of mine at the moment uh, on a book, and something we've been working on uh, is a framework which examines um, all of these different things. I'm gonna jump into that in just a moment, but I do wanna share this with you um, when it comes to using things like ChatGPT and BARD. They're a bit like every child in your classroom, okay? You have to check their work. Because just because it will enable you to do something, and it'll give you a great response, it isn't always true. So recently we saw a, a case where a lawyer in the US had used uh, a generative AI tool to help him with his work in, in a case in court. And rather than giving the correct precedent, it took one case from here, one case from here, brought them together, and made a completely made up case that brought the best bits of both of them together. And he used it in court. And was like, I don't recognize this. They dived into it, found out he, it got, as you can imagine, he got into a lot, an awful lot of trouble. So if you are using it, if, if a, a great example of, of how tools like ChatGPT and Bard can help is where you take a transcript from a YouTube video, okay? And in that YouTube, uh, in the transcript, you bang that into your generative AI tool. And then from that, you can ask it to create some lesson plans, to create some multiple choice questions, so forth and so on. But how many teachers will sit and watch all of the video to make sure the content of the video is correct before it even gets to that stage? Sure, it can help. It can save us time. It can do lots and lots of different things. But the output should always, always uh, be checked. So I mentioned some things to consider when it comes to using these tools in schools. Well, data privacy is obviously important, as is data security. And uh, Abid uh, regularly shares these sorts of things. Um, he's talking a little bit about that in his session later on today as well. The first thing my mini-me, Dougie, son said to me when I showed him ChatGPT. First thing, that is so cool. Second thing, can I use it for my homework, right? 
every kid in your school will be like my son, wanting to use it. They use Sparks Maths. When I'm not keeping an eye on him when he's doing his homework, he does split screen. He's got Sparks Maths over here. He's got ChatGPT here, split screen. He's being asked his maths questions for his homework here, and he's just getting the answers straight from ChatGPT here. Why wouldn't you do that if you can get away with it? Right? So think about these sorts of things. And how do you, as a school, counteract that? Do you block it? Well, blocking it isn't going to work. So how can you support your staff and your student community? Things like digital citizenship and digital literacy have never been so important. Obviously, it can help reduce your workload. That concern about bias. I sometimes see some bias in the, um, when, I, when I share that um, table comparing ChatGPT and BARD and what have you, we often see some bias leaning towards BARD, as you might imagine, uh, on, on the table that's produced. And how do you support that training? How do you support that confidence and competence that you want all of your teachers to have? Well, when you're thinking about teaching and learning with technology and using um, something like generative AI, I share these five steps as being a means of making sure that you get good impact from what it is that you're creating. So be precise and specific with what you're sharing or asking it to do. Tell it exactly what you want it to do in minutia. And ask it to do more than just one thing, because it will cope with more than one thing. Be prepared for it not to work first uh, time and to iterate it and improve it and make it and develop it. And then give it a role. You know, I'm a year six teacher and uh, you're the, I'm the best year six teacher in the world. I'm this, I'm that, I'm that, I'm this. That. Or be really specific with what you actually ask it uh, to do. I'm going to wrap up um, to uh, the session today uh, with, a, with a few challenges. Um, so what is your approved approach or AI tools that are allowed to be used across your school. If you're in school leadership, share what is approved, but link it into some sort of acceptable use policy for staff. Tell them how they should be using it, because they will want to be using it, because it's fantastic for reducing workload, right? So why not make it so that you're really on the, on the ball with that, and not just acceptable use for your staff, but also for your students and pupils. It could be even, I've seen some schools, and some schools I'm working with, will have a completely separate policy for AI, for students, staff, and so forth and so on. And the final thing I'll share with you uh, today is around this uh, model here. Lots of people have contributed uh, to this thinking from, oh, I'm trying to remember everybody's name, but if you want to be getting um, any kind of impact at scale, it's, it's obviously, it's more about people than it is about the technology, but if you want to spend time considering the confidence of your staff, the competence of your staff, supporting them to make those informed decisions around using technology, around that TPAP model that I shared before, and then getting that consistency, and then the kicker is within your context. Those are the five sort of key things that I would urge you to sort of try and think about when it comes to your work with technology in your school, regardless of whether it's artificial intelligence or not. So I hope you found that interesting and useful. I'm loitering most of the day. Um, if you want more, then obviously you can follow me on social media. Uh, if you Google ICT Evangelist, you'll find me like everywhere, uh, on YouTube and Twitter and so forth and so on. You'll find my website and things. And um, available to pre-order soon as well. I'm working on a book with my good friend, Ollie Lewis. I'm working with, thank you very much, uh, John Katz, uh, um, uh, be uh, putting this uh, on Amazon imminently. Um, but it covers all these sorts of things in depth and more. Um, thank you for coming to my session. I hope you found it useful. And thank you to LGFL for having me. Thank you.